world news tonight. Energy crisis. The United Kingdom deploy more support to handle the growing world panic. Tackling the Taliban. Biden contradicted his own military as the aftermath of troop withdrawals caused major fallout. Jab Jeopardy. The World Trade Organization shed more light on the growing gap between the vaccinated and unvaccinated. Young Visionary. One special boy proves if there is a will, there most certainly is a way. From the global resources of the Verna Media Network, this is Other Verna World News Tonight. Now reporting from Studio 24 in Colombo, here's Suzanne Shainali. Good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. We start off today's coverage from the United Kingdom. Britain put the army on standby to deliver fuel after an acute shortage of truckers triggered panic buying that left fuel pumps dry across the land and raised fears that hospitals would be left without doctors and nurses. Let's cross over to other than a World News Special Correspondent Delini Senvi Ratna reporting from London in the United Kingdom. For more, Delini. Yes, Shanali. Queues of drivers snaked back from those patrol stations that were still serving in major cities, though dozens of forecourts were closed with signs saying that their patrol and diesel had run dry. A post-Brexit shortage of lorry drivers, exacerbated by a debilitating halt to a truck driving license testing during Covid lockdowns, has sown chaos through British supply chains, raising the spectre of shortages and price rises in the run-up to Christmas. Business Secretary Kwasi Kwarteng said a limited number of military tanker drivers had been put on a state of readiness to be deployed to deliver fuel if necessary. Government ministers, fuel companies and petrol stations say there are sufficient supplies of fuel but the, the lack of truckers combined with panic buying has drained the system. The demand for fuel has meant that 50% to 90% of pumps were dry in some areas in Britain. Back to you, Shanali. All right, thank you. That was Adh Dharana World News Special Correspondent Dilini Senvi Ratna reporting from London in the UK. Joe Biden has gone into infrastructural overdrive as he keeps pressuring members of his party to back him on both his infrastructure deal and a wide array of spending packages for the nation. U.S. President Joe Biden on Tuesday pushed members of his own party to fund not just his infrastructure bill, but also his broader $3.5 trillion spending package as talks over both intensified. Biden met privately with lawmakers, including conservative Democratic Senators Kirsten Sinema and Joe Manchin, who have balked at the size of the spending packages. Those meetings came as Congress wrestles over a $1 trillion roads, bridges and pipes bill that has drawn support from some Democrats and Republicans, as well as separate legislation making $3.5 trillion of investments in child care, health care and housing. Most Senate Republicans have lined up against Biden's spending agenda. That has left the president and his allies on Capitol Hill with the task of convincing virtually all of his party's delegation to support him. Some Democrats would prefer to support only the infrastructure measure, while others have said they would only support the infrastructure bill if the larger social spending bill is also passed. Democratic leadership in both chambers privately tried to beat back concerns about whether they stand on sufficiently firm political footing to pass both bills, as well as a set of emergency measures to keep the government from shutting down and defaulting on its debt. Well, we have to, uh, we have to lift the debt limit. Okay. Now, government funding is set to expire on Thursday. Its borrowing authority is due to run out on October 18th. Biden scrapped his planned trip to Chicago on Wednesday in order to continue leading crucial negotiations over his agenda. The United States military faced the heat in the latest Senate talks in which the military was accused of an all too chaotic withdrawal in the Afghanistan with officials defending that the collapse of the country's government was completely unexpected. Our exit from Afghanistan was a disaster. And the Top U.S. military leaders faced blistering questions in the Senate on Tuesday about the chaotic withdrawal of troops from Afghanistan and the swift takeover of the Taliban. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin said the Afghan army's sudden collapse caught the Pentagon off guard as he acknowledged miscalculations in America's longest war, including corruption and damaged morale, among the Afghan ranks. 
The fact that the Afghan army that we and our partners trained simply melted away, in many cases without firing a shot, took us all by surprise, and it would be dishonest to claim otherwise. President Joe Biden has faced the biggest crisis of his presidency over the dramatic end to the war in Afghanistan, raising questions about his judgment and foreign policy expertise. Army General Mark Milley, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, appeared to agree under questioning that the episode, quote, damaged America's credibility. And I think that damage is one word that could be used, yes. He noted that the U.S. military had warned since late 2020 that an accelerated withdrawal without being tied to any conditions could precipitate the collapse of the Afghan military and government. Milley and General Frank McKenzie both testified that they had believed it would have been best to keep a minimum of 2,500 troops in the country. Senator, I do share that assessment. But Milley also said that by August of 2021, it became clear to him that staying meant fighting the Taliban. The risk to mission and the risk to force, and most importantly, the risk to the American citizens that are remaining, uh, that was going to go up, not down, on the 1st of September. While Republicans on the committee blamed Biden for the messy pullout, Democrats and military leaders stressed the withdrawal didn't happen overnight. Anyone who says the last few months were a failure, but everything before that was great, clearly hasn't been paying attention. Secretary Austin admitted the exit wasn't perfect, but praised American personnel who helped airlift 124,000 Afghans out of the country, an operation that also cost the lives of 13 U.S. troops and scores of Afghans in a suicide bombing outside the Kabul airport. Russia has new charges against Kremlin critic Alexei Navalny with a brand new case which could leave him behind bars for much longer. To get more details on this, other than a world news special correspondent, Malsha Patiraja joins us now from Kursk in Russia. Malsha. Yishin Ali. Russia updates campaign against jailed Kremlin critic Alexei Navalny opening a new criminal case against him that could hand him another decade in jail. The new case and its details were published on the website of Russia's investigative committee, which looks into major crimes in the country, naming Navalny as being suspected of founding and leading an extremist group. Crimes of this nature carry a maximum sentence of 10 years. The latest statements also noted Navalny's keys allies, who are also suspects in the same case, accusing them of carrying on with their alleged illegal activities after their group had been banned as extremists. Navalny is already serving two and a half years in the prison for people's viola parole violations, which he says were created to thwart his political ambitions. The charges were handed down after the Kremlin critic was flown to Germany last year for medical treatment after, after being poisoned in Siberia with what many Western experts say that military nerve agent Novichok. Navalny has continuously ac accused Russian President Vladimir Putin of ordering the attack, something the Kremlin has denied. Back to you, Shanali. All right, thank you. That was Adhidhar in a World News Special Correspondent Malsha Patiraja reporting from Kursk in Russia. Now, over in North Korea, the regime claims the projectile it lobbed on into the East Sea was a newly developed hypersonic missile. The country also convened its Supreme People's Assembly to discuss domestic issues. North Korea said on Wednesday that it has developed a hypersonic missile and confirmed that it had conducted its first test launch on Tuesday. The regime's Korea Central News Agency reported that it had fired a Hwasong-8 missile from Toyangni, Rongnim County of Chagangdo Province. The state-run media also said the test launch confirms the stability of its missile fuel ampule, which has been used for the first time. This fuel ampule appears to be referring to a container of liquid fuel. Unlike conventional missiles that need a fuel injection before firing, this type of fuel ampule can reduce the preparation time for a missile launch and have the weapon ready for use almost as fast as a solid fuel missile. The KCNA said that Park jong chun a member of the Presidium of the Politburo of the Ruling Workers' Party, guided the launch. But North Korean leader Kim Jong-un did not attend the firing. The North has fired a total of six missiles this year, but Kim Jong-un did not attend any of them. This appears to be because these new types of missiles are still in their development stage. On Tuesday, the regime also held its Supreme People's Assembly. On the first day of the meeting on Tuesday, it did not issue any message to Seoul or Washington and mostly focused on economic and other domestic matters. According to KCNA, 
laws on youth education and modifications to the National Economic Plan were discussed at the meeting, with our leader Kim Jong-un. At the meeting on Wednesday, the North plans to discuss the issue of renaming Air Korea Administration to State Air Administration. Air Korea is the North's national flag carrier. This is the second Supreme People's Assembly held this year. It was last held in January. For more news and the updates on the COVID pandemic, right after this break. Welcome back. The World Health Organization has found in its latest probe that an alarming percentage of sex abuse perpetrators within Congo were employed by the organization itself and is heartbroken with the grim statistic. The World Health Organization is heartbroken, its regional director for Africa has said, after an independent commission found that 21 out of 83 alleged perpetrators of sex abuse in Democratic Republic of Congo were employed by the WHO. Dr. Matsudiso Moeti was speaking at a media briefing on Tuesday. We in WHO are indeed humbled, horrified and heartbroken by the findings of this inquiry. I'd like also to thank all the women and girls who have come forward and given evidence to the investigation and thus have given us the basis on which to take action in WHO, which has been necessary. The Commission found that the abuse, including nine allegations of rape, were committed by both national and international staff. The report said alleged victims were also not provided with the necessary support and assistance required for such degrading experiences. In an investigation published last year by the Thomson Reuters Foundation and the New Humanitarian, more than 50 women accused aid workers from the WHO and leading charities of demanding sex in exchange for jobs during the 2018 to 2020 Ebola crisis. WHO Director General Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus said the Commission's report made for harrowing reading. I'm sorry. I'm sorry for what was done to you by people who were employed by WHO to serve and protect you. I'm sorry for the ongoing suffering that this event must cause. I'm sorry that you have had to, rele to relieve them in talking to the Commission about your experiences. Tedros said the organization will ban those identified as perpetrators from future employment with the WHO and would notify the broader UN system. He said the WHO was terminating the contracts of four people identified as perpetrators who were still employed by the agency when it was made aware of the allegations against them. Japanese Prime Minister Yoshihida Suga officially announced that he would not extend the state of emergency in the country. This will be the first time since April that all emergency measures will be lifted. Japan will finally lift its coronavirus state of emergency in all regions on Thursday for the first time in nearly six months. It comes as the number of new cases and deaths falls and the strain on the medical system eases, Prime Minister Yoshihide Suga said. Even though daily cases have fallen nationwide from more than 25,000 last month to around 1,100 on Monday, the opening will still be gradual. Some curbs on eateries and large-scale events will remain for about a month to prevent a resurgence. Officials said that a ban on serving alcohol would be lifted everywhere unless local governors objected. Japan's largely avoided explosive outbreaks seen in countries like the United States and India, but the infectious Delta variant sparked a fifth wave of COVID-19 in Japan that drove infections to record levels last month. The emergency will be lifted shortly after the ruling Liberal Democratic Party picks its new chief, who will replace Suga as premier. Suga decided not to run in the election after his approval ratings tanked. Initially criticised for its sluggish vaccination rollout, now nearly 60% of Japan's population is fully vaccinated and the government said all those who want shots will have had them by November. 
Chilean health and education ministers kicked off a vaccination campaign for children between the ages of 6 and 11 at schools as it moves forward with one of the most advanced COVID-19 prevention campaigns in Latin America. A coronavirus vaccination drive broadened in Chile. The country began inoculating 6 to 11-year-olds with China's Sinovac. This as the campaign for adolescents was already underway. I came to get the jab to take care of my family and to be more protected. Excellent. Excellent news because this pandemic has brought a lot of fear and uncertainty. It's great for us parents to be reassured that our children are vaccinated and protected. Children in Chile will require parental permission to receive their coronavirus inoculation. Authorities in the country are hoping to have the one and a half million school students between the ages of 6 and 11 all vaccinated by December. We know they've waited for a long time, but we have finally reached this stage in which vaccines have been approved for children. They are safe and effective. While many countries have approved vaccinations for adolescents, Chile joins a handful of states, including Cambodia and El Salvador, to begin inoculations in children. For now, only toddlers in the United Arab Emirates, China and Cuba can receive a coronavirus vaccination. Last week, Pfizer announced its vaccine was safe for children over the age of five. The company is expected to ask U.S. authorities for approval within days. The World Trade Organization chief has once again pointed out the drastic inequity in global jab distribution, stating that the situation is devastating towards already crippling nations and in particular Africa. The COVID-19 vaccination rate in Africa is around 4%. On Tuesday, the head of the World Trade Organization described that as devastating. Director General Ngozi Nkonjo Awela's remarks came at the opening session of a Geneva-based trade event. While nearly 60% of people in developed countries are fully vaccinated, in Africa the figure is barely 4%. This is devastating for the lives and livelihoods of Africans. It is morally unacceptable and as new variants spread, a threat to the health and economic recovery everywhere. Also voicing his concerns at the event was South Africa's President Cyril Ramaphosa. This is not the time just to be unidimensionally focus on just profit. This is the time to save lives. The WTO began discussions on a waiver to intellectual property rules for COVID-19 products about a year ago. But several countries with strong pharmaceutical industries, including host Switzerland, remain opposed. Also at the event, the WTO said it expected all countries, including China, to collaborate in the second phase of a probe into the origins of the virus. Welcome back and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. The head of the WHO has said that he expects all countries, including China, to collaborate in the second phase of investigations into the origins of the coronavirus. Residence Consultancy ranks London as the best city in the world with Paris being the runner-up, New York third and Moscow fourth. Sanofi has given up developing its own mRNA-based COVID-19 vaccine because of the dominant position of the BioNTech-Pfizer alliance. The 3.5-meter-tall puppet depicting a Syrian refugee girl arrived in Geneva as part of an 8,000 kilometer walk across Europe to raise awareness of the plight of young refugees. Kabul residents said they hoped for improvements in health care and medicine availability under the Taliban. Residents said that there is a need to bring most doctors back and address medicine shortages. And finally tonight, making the impossible Possible is not an easy task, but this young boy inspires the world with his broad and vibrant vision despite the lack of physical ability. 15-year-old starting quarterback Jason Bracey has a clear vision of what it takes to win on the field, even though he'll never see it with his own eyes. He developed retinal cancer as a toddler, and by the time he turned seven, his sight was gone. Bracey liked other sports, but he really wanted to play football. His parents' response? No way. How is this going to be possible for him to get out there and play? Eventually, Bracey became his own agent. 
once he got his own phone, he figured out how to call the teams around the area and start asking the coaches. Bracey got his chance with the Modesto Raiders. He memorizes every play and where every player is supposed to be. Take a look at this 20-yard pass. It's all memory. It's all about having trust in the player, in the receiver, and in the team. Seven, seven now. His dad guides him from the sidelines with a walkie-talkie. Bracey hears him through his helmet. I only want on the, a team to know that I can't see because then they might, then they might ease up on me. His ultimate goal, to make it all the way to the NFL. And that's all the news we have for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow with another edition of World News. I'm Suzanne Shanali. Until then, stay safe and have a good night.